Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for coming to our last session of the day, part of the um, planning stream. Um, our presentation today um, is about the Tuolatan River Water Quality Model Development and Calibration. Uh, and our presenter is Bernadelle Garstecki. Um, she's a research assistant at the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at Portland State University. She has her Master of Science in Civil and Environmental Engineering and her Bachelor of Science in Portland, from Portland State University. Uh, and a BA from the University of Oregon in International Studies in Spanish. So please join me in welcoming Bernadelle. All right, well, thank you for sticking around um, and this presentation, that's one of the day. Yep, I'm Bernadelle Garsecki, and I am a co-author of this project, the Tualatin River 2013 through 2020 uh, Water Quality Model Development and Calibration. Uh, additional authors are Scott Wells and Chris Berger at Portland State University, um, as well as Scott Menzel at Clean Water Service. So uh, a roadmap of the presentation, I'll start with a background and purpose, um, and then follow that up with model development. Um, consisting of requirements for the model, um, as well as the system domain, uh, which for this project is Hag Lake, the Tualatin River, and tributaries. I'll go over some of the um, main inflows and withdrawals of the system, as well as some different sediment dynamic techniques that we use in the model. I'll follow that up with model calibration, um, go over the methodology that we use to calibrate these models, um, and share some brief model results um, of, of this model. And then I'll end with a summary. So why develop a water quality model? Well, a model allows us to um, look at a water body or a system um, of interest holistically. So if our output is not meeting desired beneficial use water quality standards, then we can use our model to look at how we might be able to change inputs into the system to meet those standards. So for example, if we want to look at how changing wastewater treatment plant operations might impact our water quality, uh, we can use the model to look at um, different operation scenarios and how those also interact with other inputs into the system, um, some of which we might have less control over. Uh, that could be meteorological conditions, air temperature, um, flow, um, or maybe the topography of the system. So we can use the model to look at all of these together in assessing our water quality. So for this particular project, our study area is the Tualatin River in Oregon. Uh, it originates in the coast range to the west of Portland and ultimately drains to the Willamette River that runs through Portland. Uh, some interesting features of this system, uh, there's precipitation from mainly October through March. There's no significant snowpack. Uh, there's both municipal and irrigation withdrawals, um, as well as four wastewater treatment plant discharges um, from plants operated by Clean Water Services. Uh, and one interesting feature is the very low velocity of this river, particularly um, at the downstream end. So the figure on the right here uh, shows the Tualatin River near Stafford Road, and it's very lake-like, uh, very low velocity. And due to this, uh, it's highly sensitive to water quality and changes in input. And in the summer, there are low flows, but high demands. So all of these uh, led Clean Water Services to initiate the development um, of the model so that they could use this to predict uh, water quality as a result of uh, both watershed conditions. So maybe looking at how climate change might impact flows and temperature in the system, uh, as well as looking at wastewater treatment plant operations. Um, so running different scenarios to see how that might impact uh, downstream conditions. And ultimately looking at how uh, that might affect um, or meet total maximum daily load limits. So for this project, the model domain is the Tualatin River and Hat Lake, um, shown here in red on the map. Um, and of particular interest are these four wastewater treatment plants, again, operated by Clean Water Services. Uh, the time period for this model is 2013 through 2020. Uh, so that's a continuous model simulation through that period. Um, I believe the model outputs predictions every hour. So we have hourly model predictions for those eight years. And the model selected was C equal W2. So a little bit more about those wastewater treatment plants. Um, 
So the figure on the left, the graph shows the time series of flows in the system. So the blue shows the Tualatin River inflow um, into our model domain, uh, indicated by the blue arrow on the image on the right. The green is the combined um, or total Tualatin River outflow from our model domain, uh, indicated by the arrow in the diagram. And then the pink is the combined wastewater treatment plant flow. That's the sum of all four treatment plants. They don't all discharge um, all the time, but it's the sum of all the flows when they were discharging. And what's um, interesting about this system is this is particularly in the summer, as I have highlighted, the combined wastewater treatment plant flow um, often exceeds the uh, Tualatin River input into the system. And it's about 30% uh, of the overall flow leaving our model domain. And so there's particular interest in looking at how these wastewater treatment plants, how the flow um, and different scenarios, discharge scenarios might impact that water quality downstream. Um, other flows into the system in, consist of um, Goggins Creek, uh, which is impounded by Hag Lake um, Dam. And so that's able to um, also compensate for some of that flow demand in the summer. So we chose C equal W2 as the model to use. Um, it's a public domain model. It's been around for 30 to 40 years, used worldwide uh, for lakes, reservoirs, and rivers. Um, it's very well suited for um, long water bodies um, in particular, as well as um, deep water bodies that stratify. So it's two-dimensional, uh, longitudinal and vertical. I'll play this animation here. Uh, this shows temperature contours in Hag Lake. Uh, so it's a side view. The longitudinal would be from left to right, the flow direction, um, and the vertical would be top to bottom. And then this model is uh, laterally averaged, so it'd be in two and out of the picture. Uh, it predicts both hydrodynamics as well as water quality, um, and predicts state variables such as temperature, dissolved oxygen, pH, uh, algae nutrients, um, CBOD, uh, any number of generic constituents, metals, tracers, the list goes on. Um, but all of these can be modeled depending on your system. And it can also um, model different sediment dynamics, which I'll talk about a little bit later. So this is a nice figure here uh, from the EPA guidance on modeling that shows uncertainty uh, versus model complexity. And so I will show kind of results from two different models that fall on either kind of end of this. But on the model complexity side, as we have a more complex model, so to the right on the x-axis, uh, maybe we are incorporating more dynamics, um, more processes in our model. Our model framework uncertainty, the dashed green line, uh, decreases. So our model uncertainty decreases. However, our data uncertainty increases. So we need more data to support a more complex model, which we often don't have all that data. Um, maybe it's costly to get, or for other reasons, we just uh, have more uncertainty uh, in the data. And then on the other side, on the left of the x-axis, we have a less complex model. Um, and so our model framework uncertainty increases. Perhaps we're making more um, generalizations or assumptions to use this model. And so our model framework uncertainty increases, but we need less data to support that. Um, so ultimately, we want to find this point of minimum uncertainty, uh, where our model framework and data uncertainty combined are at a minimum. And this will depend on your model, your system of interest, um, as well as what sort of requirements you have for your model. So I'll kind of transition into model development. Uh, this slide shows some of the general requirements that are needed for a model. Um, if we're just looking at hydrodynamics and temperature, uh, we'll need to develop bathymetry, which goes along with a model grid. Uh, so that would be longitudinal um, segment distances, as well as vertical uh, layer depths. We'll also need meteorological inputs, air temperature, wind speed, solar radiation, cloud cover, things like that. And then we'll also need to develop time series inputs for boundary conditions for flow and temperature, as well as time series for our inputs. And then we need to define any of our withdrawals. And if we're looking at water quality, in addition to that, we also need uh, time series inputs for um, concentration for boundary conditions and our inputs. And then we also need to define a sediment simulation to use. So as sort of a, um, an example of what some of those time series might look like, 
Uh, this is for the Durham wastewater treatment plant, shown with the, the red dot in the figure. And this is for orthophosphates. So this would be the time series that we input into the model uh, for this particular wastewater treatment plant. And all of these, or this um, time series is developed um, directly off of the measured data at the outflow. And similar for ammonia, um, this is developed based off of the data from the outflow. I think we had daily measurements to develop these. Um, and similar for the carbonaceous biochemical oxygen demand. This was based off of measured five-day BOD data uh, that we calculated the CBOD ultimate shown here uh, with uh, decay rates that we calculated. And then this would then be partitioned into uh, labile, refractory, uh, dissolved, and particulate pools that we would use as model inputs. And so all of the tributaries, wastewater treatment plants, boundary conditions require um, these time series inputs to be developed for all of the different constituents that we're looking at. And so for this system, uh, again, it's Hag Lake in the Tualatin River. It's approximately 59 river miles. Uh, we also modeled three side branches, shown in blue, uh, 18 tributaries, 10 withdrawals, so those four wastewater treatment plants, as well as two dams. So one at Hag Lake and one at the end of our model domain at the Lake Oswego Diversion Dam. The side branches differ in the tributaries um, in that they're, they're larger inputs. They require separate bathymetry and model grid that connects to the main stem model grid. Uh, the tributaries are just point source um, discharges into the, into the system. And the wastewater treatment plants are treated in the model as, as the tributaries as well. So that's just like point source uh, discharges. Uh, the withdrawals, I believe one is a municipal. Um, there's a handful that are irrigation, some smaller irrigation, as well as the Walton Valley Irrigation District. Um, and there's also the Lake Oswego uh, diversion. So as I mentioned, all of our branch and tributary inputs require those flow, temperature, and constituent um, time series input files to be developed, uh, where we use measured data as much as possible, um, only remove outliers if we have good reason to do so. Otherwise, we develop these based off entirely off of data. Um, if we have any gaps in our time series, uh, we can use there's various methodologies. We use regressions um, between similar parameters to fill those gaps, or maybe between flow if there's a good seasonal pattern. Um, and for some tributaries, we had no measurements at all, so we might use a nearby tributary to, um, to use as input. And so once we developed all of the inputs based off of data as best we could, we would then adjust um, ratios and coefficients during calibration. So ratios might be um, chlorophyll A to algae biomass, um, help calculate the, the total um, amount of, of algae biomass in the system. Um, and some coefficients might be settling velocities or decay rates and things like that. So those would all be adjusted during calibration if we need to um, uh, match field data better. And then we developed, for this project, we developed two sediment models. So one is a combined zero order and first order model. And then the second is a sediment diagenesis model. So we originally started with only modeling um, or only using the sediment diagenesis model, but we were having a difficult time in calibrating uh, the model to field data. And so we decided to sort of model in parallel the zero order and first order model to see if we could better understand uh, what was happening in the system and why we, were, we weren't able to uh, calibrate with just the sediment diagenesis. So I'm looking at those in a little bit more detail. Um, so first we'll look at the zero order and first order model. So the zero order model um, is just a set sediment oxygen demand um, that you provide to the model um, at each model segment. And it's only a function of temperature, but it's relatively constant throughout the year. And then it provides an anoxic release of nutrients back into the water column. And this is a good um, model to use for sort of background SOD. Um, or maybe historic SOD that has deposited previously, and you have this, this background that's providing this, at this um, oxygen demand to your system. And then we often couple this with the first order model. Um, so the zero order model is great for that background, but it has no mechanism for uh, recent accumulation of any organic matter uh, coming into the system. So in the, the table, the disadvantage is it's unclear how management strategies would affect the SOD with just using that zero order model. 
So coupling this with the first order model allows us to also account for those recent accumulations. So uh, CBOD, algae, uh, labile and refractory particulate organic matter will settle out into the sediments, uh, consume oxygen, and then provide this aerobic um, decay of nutrients back into the water column. So with both these together, we have an anoxic release as well as an aerobic release of nutrients. And we can account for the historic background SOD as well as the more um, recent accumulations. However, those together are not fully predictive as we do need to choose that, that again, that constant SOD value as well as um, uh, one sediment decay rate. And so the other option here is the sediment diagenesis model. And so this model is fully predictive. Um, if we think back to the figure previously, the model complexity diagram, this would be on the right as a more complex model, uh, but more correct. Um, and then the other zero order first order would be a less complex model. And so the sediment diagenesis model has both an aerobic layer and an anaerobic layer, and it accounts for um, flux between those layers of, of nutrients, fluxes back into the water column, as well as burial from the system. Um, but as I had kind of discussed earlier, uh, a more complicated model requires more data to support that. And so the sediment diagenesis model being fully predictive um, is very dependent on that flux of particulate organic matter into the system. So the, the arrow on the top left. If we are not capturing that um, with our sampling events and are not um, creating our input files that have all of the different flux of organic matter into the system, then the sediment diagenesis model will, it'll be difficult for that to calibrate to field data. Um, there are some ways to, we did make some assumptions in order to use this model and I'll, I'll discuss those. Uh, a little bit later. So for the zero order and first order model, we are able to specify um, a sediment oxygen demand um, specific to model segments. So we might have an SOD of one gram per meter squared um, for some upstream segments and maybe 1.5 at other segments. Um, this is, can be based off of field data um, if it's available. Otherwise, we might adjust these during model calibration. And then similarly for the sediment diagenesis model, uh, we can specify this particular organic carbon, initial concentrations of particular organic carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus, um, just specific to model segments, um, and as well as those diagenesis rates. So those would also be specific to model segments. And in the sediment diagenesis model, the diagenesis rates, we have those for, um, it's a different rate at each model segment for each of the um, different initial concentrations, so carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus all have their own uh, diagenesis rates. And these are the, these for um, the sediment diagenesis model, these are just initial concentrations that you specify as soon as you hit start on the model simulation, uh, the influx of organic matter will partition into those different pools and then it'll fluctuate. So we'll move now into model calibration. So for this project, all this entire list, um, these are all of the state variables that we modeled. And those that have a check next to them are ones that had field data available for comparison or for calibration. So all of these had field data available except for organic matter groups, um, epiphyton and zooplankton. Um, so there was a, and I think we had maybe 10 or 12 different stations that had various amounts of this data. So a lot of different stations that we were able to use um, to calibrate the model. This is sort of a, a big picture look at our model calibration methodology. Um, in sort of a, a quick um, summary of it, we have measured inputs that both go into the real system as well as our model system. And then we have model predictions as, and that we compare to field data observations. And so in those observations, we have all of the unmeasured inputs that weren't captured for a model. There might be measurement errors, um, but the difference in the model predictions and the field data, those are our errors. When we calculate three errors that we use and compare um, that we use for all of our different state variables. So the mean error, um, absolute mean error, and the root mean square error. Uh, the mean error is a good indicator of bias of the model. So if we have a positive mean error, if it's temperature, um, then that would indicate that our model is predicting values warmer than the field data. Um, and the root mean square error um, has that squared component. And so that will weight uh, larger errors more and is a good indicator of the, the spread. 
So both the absolute mean error and root mean square error um, will take into account um, kind of the overall error. Since the mean error, we could have a mean error of zero, um, but we might have very positive and very negative values um, that that won't capture. So all of these together are sort of a good summary of what, um, how the model is doing. So for Hag Lake, um, all of the model predictions were taken at segment 29 uh, near the dam. Um, we have both vertical profiles measured just upstream of the dam um, for most of those water quality uh, state variables. And then we also had um, both continuous and synoptic data at the outflow of the dam. So we had uh, continuous data would be flow, uh, dissolved oxygen, pH, conductivity. Um, and then the synoptic would be all the nutrients, um, suspended solids and things like that. And for the Tualatin River, all of the blue dots are the sampling locations. Um, but I will show some results just from Tualatin River at Stafford Road uh, towards the end of the model domain. We'll start by looking at some model comparisons for Hag Lake. Um, so this is pH, a time series of pH. We have the zero order and first order model on the left and the sediment diagenesis model on the right. And so I'll kind of isolate one year. Um, pH and dissolved oxygen were the most difficult um, state variables for us to calibrate, particularly for the sediment diagenesis model. And again, this goes back to the influx of, of organic matter into the system. And so this is kind of a good illustration of that. For the first order and zero order model, um, being able to specify just that background SOD rate as well as um, our uh, CO2 release rates, we were able to calibrate the model very well to the field data. So the model is shown in red and the field data continuous in blue and then grab samples shown with the black diamonds. But for the sediment diagenesis model, our model results were too high um, than the, or higher than the field data. You can see the mean error as well. 0.245 is, is higher than the first zero order and first order mean error. And this is due to not enough particulate organic carbon coming into the system, settling out, and then through decay, converting into inorganic carbon that would lower the, uh, the pH. We could have artificially added more POC in our inputs. Um, we had no good basis to do that. Uh, we did make another assumption, which I'll share later, um, that we, we used to match a lot of the um, other field data. And so, yeah, 6.6 .6 model minimum for the zero order and first order compared to the seven for the sediment diagenesis. And I'll show a couple um, profile animations here for Hag Lake. So this is a dissolved oxygen uh, vertical profile with depth. And so we're able to match the field data quite well for the zero order and first order and similarly for the sediment diagenesis. I think these were um, similar error statistics. And then for pH, however, for the zero order, first order, um, we have fairly good model data agreement throughout the simulation period. Um, but for the sediment diagenesis, uh, the surface is all right, um, but towards the, the bottom of the water column, our pH in our, our model, shown in blue, is too high compared to the field data. So you kind of see that it's just not quite getting low enough. And again, that's that, that POC. We just don't have enough POC in the system. And now we'll move to the Tualatin River, show some, some uh, comparisons there. Um, so again, zero order, first order on the left, sediment diagenesis on the right. And this is a time series of temperature. And this is just to illustrate that there's almost no difference at all um, between these two models for temperature. Uh, mean error for both is close to zero. Um, and then the error results for all, all the different errors are less than one degree Celsius, um, which is a target that we often um, try and meet for temperature calibration. Um, and this is dissolved oxygen time series. Um, so yeah, mean error of 0.22 for the zero order uh, first order and a mean error of 0.61 for the sediment diagenesis. So again, dissolved oxygen is just a little bit too high. Um, our influx of organic matter is, is a little bit too low. So we're not able to, to um, bring that down quite as much, but overall um, these error statistics are, are really good. Similar for pH, a little bit too high, but overall good model data agreement for both models. Um, orthophosphate time series. Um, again, good model data agreements. Um, one thing to point out, you might see that the, the orthophosphate is increasing in those last three years. Um, and that's due to clean water services switching from chemical to biological um, phosphorus removal. Uh, but the model is able to, to capture those, 
those uh, peaks. And then similar for ammonia time series. The sedimentite genesis, the ammonia is a little bit too high um, due to um, the digenesis rates that we had. Um, and then uh, nitrate, uh, very good for both of those. And so sort of a, a summary for the sediment diagenesis model, in order for us to um, match, to calibrate to the field data, we had to set a very large initial refractory organic matter concentration, that's the graph on the right, which we slowly decay, decayed over time. And so that sort of mimicked what the zero order SOD model would do, set that background oxygen demand. Um, but we allow the labile organic pool, um, the figure on the left, to seasonally fluctuate. And so we sort of made the assumption that um, there was either we're missing those storm events that are coming in throughout the year, um, or perhaps there is a large buildup of organic matter in the system already that is, in this case, slowly decaying over time. So how can this model be used? Both models, both the first order and sediment diagenesis, have been calibrated um, and can be used by clean water services um, to assess water quality as a result of both um, watershed conditions. So those might be changes uh, as a result of climate change, looking at how temperatures or flows into the system might affect downstream water quality. Um, and they can also use it for wastewater treatment plant operations. So looking at how different um, discharge scenarios, how flows might change or temperatures or concentration and how that might impact, again, the water quality. I have kind of an example on the right that looks at what the original orthophosphate input is into the system and a potential operation scenario might be looking at a 50% reduction um, in orthophosphate. And so um, what we would do in the model is just use the blue um, time series as inputs into the system and then compare that to our uh, original calibrated model. And we can also use the model to look at different reservoir operations, how uh, changing outlet controls um, might allow us to meet our downstream temperature and water quality targets. So in summary, uh, we developed and simulated the Hag Lake in the Tualatin River continuously uh, from 2013 through 2020. Uh, a model had been developed previously that simulated from 2013 through 2015. So we extended that model, um, but it also required us to redevelop all of the input files, um, boundary conditions, tributaries using uh, updated assumptions um, and uh, regressions. And we de developed the model for both the zero order and first order model and sediment diagenesis. So everything was identical between those two models. The only difference being the sediment uh, technique we used. Uh, both models matched the field data well for the full simulation. Um, however, the first order model was slightly better, um, particularly for uh, um, pH and dissolved oxygen. Um, and yeah, those were the two that were the most difficult to calibrate for the two models, um, likely due to um, the inputs um, not capturing all of the organic matter loading into the system. Um, so perhaps it's difficult to capture all of the sticks and large debris that might occur in large storm events, um, but that's important, particularly for that sediment diagenesis model to accumulate that. Um, yep, and the water bodies might already have a large buildup of organic matter in the system, uh, which we Made it, we made that assumption for the sediment diagenesis model um, and set that large initial refractory pool. And then for the zero order, first order, um, had that the, the SOD value um, allows for that. And, and the fact that the first order and zero order model were able to match the field data for those continuous eight years of data, um, that indicates that this um, system is at steady state. So thank you, I can take any questions. Great, thank you, Bernadelle. Um, so we have about 10 minutes for questions. Um, there's a microphone in the center of the room and I can also walk this one around for anyone who has a question to ask. All right, I'll start. Um, I'm curious if there are any um, next steps that you're planning on taking either with the model or with any of the findings that you've had. Yeah, um, so I believe Clean Water Services is currently running scenarios with the model. Um, and we do uh, one, one kind of big next step that we'd like to take at some point is updating the bathymetry. Um, we're using bathymetry from quite a few years ago. Um, and so future model developments, um, hopefully we'll be able to um, yeah, revise the bathymetry. Thank you. 
just going to check if we have any questions that came through in the live stream. And for sort of the time period to develop this model, um, I think this, this version took about a year and a half um, from development and calibration. Again, we had the bathymetry already done, but all of the input files were developed um, essentially from scratch um, using all these new, uh, new data regressions. Yeah, so was there, was there anything in this <clears throat> as you went through this that kind of stood out? Any big surprises for you? Any kind of unexpected uh, things that you had to deal with in this? Um, yeah, I suppose sort of, you know, doing the sediment diagenesis model to start um, and making a lot of different changes and nothing was really bringing down uh, the dissolved oxygen. It was continuously too high. Uh, we did some, some scenarios where we increased the inputs. Um, so instead, so we made the assumption that we had that sort of background um, historical accumulation. Another option is to increase the organic matter coming in from the inputs and the tributaries. And we ran some scenarios with that and we're able to bring the dissolved oxygen down. Um, but we felt that we had less sort of to back that up than we did um, to just kind of set this initial concentration very high. Um, but comparing the sediment diagenesis and then I ran the first order zero order model with all the same inputs and had almost immediately, you know, good model data agreement. And so that kind of indicated that we were missing something with that sediment diagnosis model. Any other questions? All right, thank you very much, Bernadette, that was great. And thanks everyone for joining us on